Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience and holding. We now have your presenters in conference. Please be aware that each of your lines is in a listen-only mode. You may submit your questions electronically at any time during today's presentation by using the Q&A window located to the left of your slideshow. Underneath that window, you'll also see a window labeled Resources where you may download a PDF copy of today's PowerPoint presentation. Please also note that we'll be playing a video during today's call, and you'll need to make sure that your computer speakers are turned on and unmuted to hear the audio from the video. With that, I'd like to turn the conference over to our first presenter, Dr. Thomas Burke. Hello, and uh, good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for uh, joining us today. We're really thrilled to uh, present uh, some of the great quality projects uh, done by Northwell Health, the winner of the 2018 AHA Quest for Quality Prize. Uh, the agenda for the call today will include uh, a, a really terrific video that outlines uh, specifically some of the work teams at Northwell, and then a presentation by Dr. Mark Jarrett, the Chief Quality Officer at Northwell Health, who's going to take us through uh, a lot of their processes, some of their specific projects, and then we'll spend the second half of the hour on uh, questions and answers between uh, you and Mark. So the speakers for today include myself. I'm Tom Burke. I'm uh, a GYN oncologist by medical training. I spent uh, 10 years in the United States Army and then a 30-year uh, clinical and administrative career at the uh, University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. I uh, had a wonderful time serving as a board member on AHA from uh, 2013 to 2015. And then uh, as part of that board service and subsequently I have uh, served on and chaired AHA's Quest for Quality Prize Committee. Also on today's call will be uh, Dr. Mark Jarrett, the Chief Quality Officer at Northwell Health. Uh, Mark is a terrific uh, clinician, administrator, and an incredibly innovative person I think you're really going to enjoy the insights that he brings, uh, both from a background in internal medicine, rheumatology, and geriatrics, but more importantly to uh, clinical quality, safety, employee engagement, and many of the things that are important to all of us as we go forward. So we'd like to open uh, the session today. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank Sanjay Malavia, the CEO of RL Solutions, who are the absolutely terrific sponsors of the Quest for Quality Prize. Uh, Sanjay and his team have been supportive of all aspects of the committee engagement and uh, prizes that you see put forward, and we want to thank them for their engagement and participation. Uh, with that, we'll move to the video and then into Dr. Jarrett's presentation. <laughs> Medal of Honor recipient William A. Foster once said, quality is never an accident. It's always the result of high intention, sincere effort, intelligent direction, and skillful execution. It represents the wise choice of many alternatives. This year's honorees for the American Hospital Association Quest for Quality Prize, with the generous support from RL Solutions, certainly embody this sentiment. Northwell Health in New Hyde Park, New York, the 2018 prize winner, has earned this award in part for its intentional use of innovation to spur improvement. Its shark tank approach to unleashing new ideas encourages creativity. It breeds new approaches to unlocking not just today's challenges, but seizing tomorrow's opportunities. We're dealing with everything from birth to death, from primary care to end of life, from medical care to social determinants. And it's built into the DNA of the organization. So it's part of the culture. Quality is not a project. It's not a department. Quality is everybody's job. So every participant in the organization, every employee, every activity right through the whole organization is responsible for quality and for driving the quality metrics, improving them challenging those which we don't think are right. Healthcare is a partnership. It's more than a relationship. Each person brings in something to the table, and we are trying to create a healthy outcome for the patients. So that is with the Northwell's motto. And we truly believe that the patients has got to be an educated customers. 
and we believe by improving the patient's health literacy we want them to be an active participants in the healthcare not just passive receivers so it is about collaboration it is not about just a patient doctor relationship the culture of care at northwell health puts the patient in the center of what we're doing and it's truly understanding that we're here to meet their needs they're they are not here to meet our needs and as a group collectively we have a mission to ensure that we deliver the highest quality of care in the most culturally sensitive way possible to a very diverse population of people we felt we needed to educate we needed to truly get the 66,000 employees of Northwell aware that health outcomes depended on many components, the social determinants, someone's cultural beliefs, someone's religious beliefs, and importantly, how we communicated with our patients. And so we've included components of linking culture, religion, communication with health outcomes. We have also started on conscious bias training because we feel that we all have implicit biases and that can affect the way we interact with our patients, the way we interact with each other. The things I would tell other, other people trying to do this is respect all of your team, not only to get them work as a team, but respect what they have to say. Recognize that everybody has something to add and that you have to include multidisciplinary teams whenever you're trying to achieve performance improvement. It can't be just the doctors and nurses, it has to be everybody who touches the patient. And Northwell truly is a place where quality is the foundation for uh, all that we do, and I would say probably the best example is at the board meetings. Uh, I've always given my quality report before finance gives their financial report, and that kind of sums it up. At RL Solutions, we're proud to be the AHA's champion sponsor for quality and to have the opportunity to recognize organizations that are pushing the boundaries of quality improvement. In working with so many organizations across the United States, we're so humbled by the dedication and effort that goes into providing quality care for patients. Northwell's commitment to meeting the diverse needs of its multicultural communities and improving access to care is truly inspiring. It's an honor to present you with this year's award and we congratulate and thank you for your incredible work. Congratulations to Northwell Health and to our finalists and citation of merit honorees. These hospitals and health systems and their caregivers serve as an inspiration to the entire field, making a real contribution to advancing health in America. Well, I hope that you saw just a little bit of uh what the award committee saw as they visited uh, Northwell during their application and assessment process. At this point, I'd really like to turn things over to uh, Mark for his uh, presentation. Mark, please go ahead. Thank you, Tom, and good morning and good afternoon to everybody, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, and I understand some people might not even be in the U.S., so whatever the time of day is for you. Uh, this is a great honor for me to uh, be able to uh, talk to you today. Uh, it certainly was an honor for Northwell uh, to win this award. And um, what I'm going to try and do is spend a few minutes kind of talking about Northwell a little bit, give you a little background about us, some of the things we've been doing that hopefully will contribute to winning this award, and then at the end, I'm going to talk for a few moments about why we participated and why we went for the award uh, so, uh, and the advantages of doing that. And I also want to uh, point out uh, that we were lucky to win it. Uh, the other uh, awardees are great places and do fantastic things, uh, which I'm sure also most of you on the phone uh, uh, do every single day as well. So that, you know, that goes without saying. Uh, what you saw in the video was actually the team, and I would just start off before I even get to the uh, first slide. It, it, what kind of defines us is all those people uh, that were speaking and other senior people, uh, their doors are always open. So from a quality viewpoint, I can walk in any moment, any time, uh, and speak to them about it. I don't need to necessarily make an appointment because quality does fit in uh, throughout the whole culture uh, of Northwell. Um, our philosophy, 
uh, is to be at the forefront of change, to be proactive. Uh, it's interesting as the politics in the United States are uh, uh, more in disarray than they ever were. Uh, many people ask our uh, CEO, uh, Mike Dowling, well, what does this mean for health care? What's the government going to do? Uh, and as he always says, it's really up to the health care industry to define how we should do things and how things should be improved, not for government to do it. We should be doing it. We always look for, we always look for obstacles, uh, for opportunities, not obstacles. And again, innovation is really critical, and you'll see that a little later. Uh, we've been growing a lot, which makes it hard, uh, but we do that. Uh, we are now the largest private employer in New York State, and we have about 68,000 employees. Uh, what is a big advantage for us is we have unified leadership. Uh, we have a single administrative and clinical leadership on the corporate level throughout the whole health system. Clearly, each hospital and ambulatory has their own leadership, uh, but it all reports up to one single board and one CEO uh, for the system. Uh, just again, to, uh, some key facts here, which I'm sure the slides will be available. Uh, clearly, you know, quality is always on our mind, and it's not just the CMS metrics or any other body's metrics. It's also just that they reflect uh, improving patient care. One thing I do in quality is whenever possible I use numerators because numerators represent people. Uh, it's not about indexes or percentages. Uh, we work very hard to provide access to care uh, in all of our, uh, all of our market uh, areas. We do have a large academic and research uh, component. Uh, we have approximately 1,500 residents and fellows throughout uh, the health system, uh, and we do a large number of uh, clinical research studies. And you can see the uh, operating statistics on the bottom right. Uh, most importantly, and part of, the, part of the issue is we span a large area. So if you look at the New York metropolitan area, our hospitals that we own are in the orange H's. Uh, we have affiliations, which we think are impor very important, uh, with other uh, health hospitals that you can see are the purple H's. So we spread all the way up into Westchester to the edge of, you know, out to the edge of Long Island and all the way down through the five boroughs in Staten Island. So we are really all over uh, the New York metropolitan area. Uh, that brings its own issues because then obviously we have to make sure uh, quality and safety uh, uh, is accounted for every place. And one thing that I think defines us as a health system is it doesn't matter if you're a quaternary hospital doing heart transplants or you're a small community hospital in a rural suburban area. Uh, the level of care for the average patient who comes in for routine stuff has to be the same no matter where you are. We try to standardize that uh, every place uh, that we can. In addition, we have a large ambulatory practice, and again, you can see the dots that kind of represent the major offices. We now have about 700 ambulatory sites. Uh, and it's interesting because as healthcare has changed, uh, for our $12 billion revenue as a health system, half of that now comes from ambulatory practice. And I think part of what we've tried to do is recognize uh, how to respond to that change in health care uh, in the United States and that the delivery is not always in the hospitals, but we have to look at it across the continuum because that's how patients look at it. They don't really think about the site of care. They just think about their care. Uh, we serve an extremely diverse community. Um, you know, both uh, ethnicity, languages, uh, and you can see some figures here based on the um, uh, communities that we serve. I will tell you at our hospital in Queens, Forest Hills Hospital, that hospital, there are 160 languages spoken in that community. is actually the most diverse community in the world in terms of languages. Uh, but all of our hospitals uh, serve varied uh, communities. And this, get, and this gets some, uh, an important fact that we'll, you know, we'll show a few slides later, but the fact is when we look at quality and safety, we, we can't look at just the large aggregate number. Uh, and I always give the example that if you look at uh, an area around a hospital that might be situated in a, in a, in a very well-to-do area, uh, you might say, well, great, your mammography rate is running uh, 90%. But the reality is that 90% may reflect that a large part of that community is um, 
uh, well-to-do has easy access, and they're running at 95%. But then there are segments of the community that are running at 40%, either due to insurance issues or due to access or due to education, why mammography is important. So we really have to look uh, at the whole picture in a very divided way and not just say, well, you know what, uh, we have a 95% rate, we're doing well. We really have to think about the community that we, the communities that we serve, all right? And that goes to this slide that you all well know that social and economic factors are probably just as important, if not more important, uh, than any other determinants of health. Certainly probably more important than genes and some of the biology and, and physical environment. Uh, and these, you know, regard economic stability, what's the neighborhood like. People are not going to uh, go for health care if they live in a neighborhood where it's dangerous to go out, uh, dangerous to go out, you know, to, to access the doctor. Uh, do they have transportation that they can afford in order to get to the health care? Uh, is the food accessible? Uh, do they live in a community where the only food available is, you know, high-calorie, uh, you know, fat foods and not really healthy foods? Uh, is there good support systems in the community? These are things we all have to address, and we have tried to address them at, at Northwell. Uh, the way we've addressed it is not by saying we should provide everything, but partnering with community uh, services that already exist and seeing how we can help them deliver those uh, needed social determinants of health to that community. Uh, because of that, we've won some, several other awards because of this, um, and uh, this is important in terms of the culture. We work a lot with the military, uh, and also we were, one of, we were the second uh, health system to actually publish publicly uh, the patient reviews of our faculty members. So, uh, act, you know, so when, you know, instead of going to Yelp or one of the others where you never know who's doing it, these are the uh, surveys that are sent to the patients. Uh, the, Physicians get ranked in stars between one and five, and um, we even publish the comments, uh, many of the comments that the uh, patients make. And it's very interesting that people who, you know, the physicians who were at four stars or three and a half stars very quickly change the way they deal with patients so they can get up to four or five stars. We also work, obviously, with population health. And we've invested a lot in startups or early phase companies, I'll get into that in a minute, uh, to be innovative in the way we deliver health care. So what we've done is we've looked at the forces that are going on in the healthcare industry today, uh, all the way from aging of the population uh, to the reality that the government has become the primary pa uh, payer, and looking to change how we can deliver health care realizing that these forces exist and you just kind of can't say, well, that they're a problem. We have to figure out the solution uh, to do this. Uh, and that means, you know, making sure that your investments address these issues. Uh, you use technology uh, so that you can improve things. Uh, and most importantly, empower the consumers, uh, both with transparent data uh, and measures, and you have to use outcomes that really measure that matter to the patients. Uh, one of the other things we do is we respond to local and national emergencies. Uh, during the Texas flooding uh, last year, uh, we sent doctors and nurses down to Houston to help. Uh, in addition, uh, we sent uh, people down to Puerto Rico to help. That was, uh, uh, you know, not only the, as part of DMAT teams, uh, but we, had, we sent down specific teams down to do that. Uh, in addition, a couple of years ago when we had the Ebola crisis, uh, we quickly uh, developed an Ebola treatment center. Um, reality is, in the way Northwell works, uh, many of us spent almost two solid weeks uh, working on our Ebola treatment plans and policies. Uh, seven day, you know, we were at the at, at corporate seven days a week working on it simultaneously. We really realized we needed a place that if we had an Ebola patient that would be safe for both the staff and the patient to be treated. And in about 72 hours converted a, a vacant ICU wing in one of our smaller hospitals into an adult Ebola treatment uh, center that became uh, both approved by the state and by the CDC. Another area we're working is we're consulting in Brooklyn where there are large underserved hospitals 
and uh, patients. Uh, this is an area where actually the state, New York State, is uh, spending approximately uh, $300 million a year to support three hospitals and working with them to try and develop them into a system uh, and trying to support, that com support those communities, uh, which really have great difficulties both because of the uh, economics in that area uh, and misdistribution of, uh, of resources between the hospitals and trying to get them uh, to uh, align in a way that really is synergistic uh, rather than competitive. And we do an innovative culture and we've had a lot of uh, things that we've worked on in terms of research and uh, new programs. Uh, one of the things that we're working on now uh, is this thing on the right. You can see the neural tourniquet that actually uses vagal nerve simulation uh, to actually reduce uh, blood loss in abdominal wounds and abdominal surgery uh, and hopefully uh, will be something that will be uh, eventually used uh, all over the, the nation. And we donate, obviously, and use a lot towards economic and community impact. We uh, give a lot of community benefits uh, and investments per year to the tune of over $1 billion. So getting back to the award, uh, when we did the application and honored organizations making significant progress in five uh, commitments by the AHA, these included access, value, partnership, well-being, and coordination. Uh, we worked hard in our application to demonstrate that, and uh, I'll talk for a second about why did we apply. Uh, so clearly, the obvious thing, and I would never deny it, is one always likes to win an award. There is nothing wrong with that. I think that that, that you know most of us in uh, healthcare are Type A individuals, and it certainly helps that. But I think the advantage really for us uh, was it doing the application, which was extensive was a good gap analysis to see where we're doing things well and where we're not maybe doing things well or where we're doing them but we're not getting the impact that we need. And I think that is a really a important uh, thing to do. Uh, I think it gives you a, a, a quick look at, wh at what you're doing, not just in quality in the classical sense, but what you're doing as, as a health system to really impact your communities and improve the, the health of your uh, uh, and well-being uh, of the people you work, you serve, not just the measures that we all classically think about. And I think that's a very very important thing. Uh, I will tell you, it was a good learning experience for us. Uh, when we actually did the presentation uh, to the surveyors, we had many of it, we had our leadership there, and we all simultaneously walked out saying, "We wish we had videotaped it," because all of us knew parts of it, but none of us realized how many things we all do, and that's a problem because that means you have people doing things in one part of your system that you may not even recognize. You should really spread to others, and I think that's another advantage of doing uh, of doing the award. So I we found that. Uh, a great experience. I will tell you, uh, Dr. Burke and the other surveyors were gracious and nice. Uh, it was not like being surveyed by a regulatory agency. It was extremely pleasant. Um, and I, I think it was a very rewarding uh, experience for Northwell. And of course, we were very, very honored uh, to win this award. So at this point, uh, I think I will stop. I uh, probably went on too long and take any questions that Dr. Burke wants to uh, Tee up. Mark, thank you uh, so much. Uh, I think all of you got just uh, uh, little snippets of everything that we saw at Northwell that was uh, deserving of this particular award. And I would, I would like to highlight a couple of things that I, I think really came through to the survey team and to the committee uh, as a whole. One, obviously, was the innovation and creativity of the system and the team to bring together over a wide geography, incredibly diverse uh, patient base, uh, all of the programs that you saw, and doing that largely with data and a requirement that the quality be similar at any of the locations that patients uh, receive their care. Uh, that was clearly uh, a highlight of the system and their efforts, and their investments in those areas are substantial. I think the other is that I would highlight is the transparency. And you heard a little bit in Mark's presentation, but 
transparency of data with patients, uh, with insurers, uh, with work teams, uh, with communities at large. Uh, there really were no filters around uh, data. And uh, certainly in all of us that are working on a quality journey, transparency of data and outcomes, I think, is a critical uh, objective. But the reality is, how do we actually make that happen? And so uh, they do a terrific job of that, and, and we saw that uh, firsthand. So I'd like to move now, invite your questions. There's opportunity to submit online. Uh, what we'd like to do is kind of pick Mark's brain and dive into any areas you'd like to explore in a little more depth. And I have a couple that have been submitted. I'll open with the first one for you, Mark. And that is, how did the Northwell culture evolve to this point? And what work has Northwell specifically done to address joy and meaning within its workforce? Okay, so I thank you, Tom. I will, uh, you know, address the first point, the first question about the culture. It, it, as a system, we came together over the last 20 years, and it is interesting to note that right from the very beginning, is the first few hospitals that came together uh, before. Before there was a discussion about um, you know finance and developing a you know a back office for finance for a system or uh, for HR, the first system meetings were actually on quality, uh, and right from the beginning uh, there was a board committee on quality, uh, and I think that really cemented it, uh, and it continues to be that way. Whenever we look to perhaps have another hospital join our health system. Uh, besides doing the financial reviews and everything else, uh, we do a thorough uh, look at the culture uh, of the organization in terms of patient safety and quality, and it's emphasized that that's really important. And what we try to do is balance a, a health system strategy with the fact that you have to be sensitive to local community culture. Uh, you know, physicians and nurses in a given hospital are very proud of what they do. They often live in that community, and, and you have to be sensitive to that uh, as well as try and steer the big aircraft carrier in the direction you want, uh, and that's kind of how we've done it. In terms of joy and meaning in the workforce, working with HR, we've worked very hard on this. We, uh, we obviously do uh, employee engagement surveys, and I must admit we've gone up quite well uh, in the last several years, um, and um, we rank very, very high. And the, and, and the reason why is it, it tends to be a friendly place where, at all the hospitals and at corporate, uh, where people really, you know, come to work every day to try and make patient care better. Uh, and that's everybody's focus. Uh, and we're sensitive to the fact that if people are stressed uh, there's a lot of programs for that. We try and make people aware that if they see a, a colleague who's stressed, you know, a fellow worker who's stressed, to say something, not just walk past it and say, well, you know what, they're having problems, maybe they're having problems at home. Because, we, you know, we really have to be our brothers and sisters keeper. We really need to work together. And I think that's made a, a big difference in, in the joy of work uh, that we've done, as well as rewarding people uh, when they do a great job or they go an extra step uh, and, and having recognition awards or points that you can turn in, doing all kinds of projects to kind of get that done. You know, I want to just uh, interject, since I was on site for the site visit, a great example to me of how you engage the uh, workforce in, in sort of the meaning of their work is there are specific concerns about workforce safety for hospitals and hospital employees. And, and we saw firsthand a security system at Northwell that was uh, designed by the, uh, the workforce itself. And so the whole process for entering, exiting, moving through the uh, different portions of the health system were really built on the input of specific employees who were concerned about their own and their patients' uh, safety in the workplace. I, I throw that out as an example I saw that kind of speaks to this topic. Let me go on to the next question, and that's, do you have some specific strategies for how to break down sort of traditional thinking and organizational mindset, and maybe specifically, as you bring on new hospitals and, and new partners into the system, how do you get them into the sort of same cultural mindset of, of uh, Northwell? Well, 
you know, it, it, it is not always the easiest thing, but the first thing we do is not walk in there and tell them you got to do everything this way, the Northwell way. Uh, we, we take it in chunks. Clearly, if there are things going on that are not, you know, safe for patients or not high quality and will impact patient care, uh, we try to intervene in a polite way very quickly. Most importantly is bringing them to the table. So um, we will, you know, invite the very, you know, invite the various leaders or even managers uh, to multiple committees uh, at the system level, uh, and they quickly see that everybody kind of works together, uh, and that it's not, you know, we're not focused on just, you know, one or two hospitals. We're focused on everybody, and that everybody has a voice. That tends to have a big impact. In addition. Uh, senior leadership, including the CEO, the COO, the chief medical officer, uh, twice a year go to every single hospital and have town halls and talk to the staff and find out their concerns. Tell them what's going on. Tell them where we're going with things. And uh, that makes a big difference. And then we have board members who actually on holidays or at nights will come into the hospital and walk the halls and thank the staff. Uh, and that really, when people see that, then they kind of say, you know, the, the, I hate to use a bad expression, they kind of drink the Kool-Aid and say, you know what, maybe they're not going to tell us what to do. They're asking us what we should do. And I think that is really the crux, the, the critical element. So we're seeing a pretty refined version at the time we did the award uh, survey. Can you talk a little bit about what was the timeline? How long did it take you to kind of maneuver the culture of the organization? And what was the strategy for how quickly people could adapt? Okay. Um, the strategy is, you know, the timeline is it depends on the hospital. Uh, but when the first series of hospitals came together, it was much more difficult because they were truly competitors with each other. Uh, we had two tertiary hospitals that were a mile apart, separated by the Long Island Expressway. And, uh, you know, for those of you who are old, you know, old enough to remember the old cowboy shows like the McCoys and the Hatfields, uh, and that took a while. Uh, but with newer hospitals, we've kind of gotten it down better. And it really starts before they actually even formally join, when, you know, when we've done all the negotiations and the things are waiting for the approvals from all the regulatory agencies. But we kind of talk about things, not what they should do, but we just introduce them to ourselves. Uh, and it really takes about, I would say on average, about three years before a hospital really truly becomes integrated. Uh, because, again, we try not to rush it. We prioritize items that, you know, if there's something, like I said, that's outstanding for patient safety or quality or obviously a financial issue, those will be addressed immediately. Uh, but the rest of it, we take it a step at a time uh, so that people are comfortable. And we also don't get unintended consequences. Uh, many times we've gone to an institu taken on an institution and they do something a little bit differently and we look at it and we say, hey, that's better than the way we do it. And then we introduce it, and then we try to take that model and introduce it back to the rest of the system. Uh, and that's very reinforcing for the, the, new one, the, the new hospital coming on, because now they, you know, now they really feel like they are contributing and they're part of it. And it takes about three years on average, for, I would say, for the hospitals to feel really comfortable and for leadership to feel comfortable, uh, because, again, it, it, I would almost say it's like a marriage. Uh, you know, it takes a little time to get adjusted. Let me switch gears a little bit. I want to talk about technology. A lot about uh, what you do as a system relies on data and uh, data, both input, sharing, transparency, things we've talked about. Can you talk first a little bit about what technical and technology investments have you made specifically aimed at your quality programs? Sure. So, I mean, we, we've done the usual things that everybody else has in terms of developing a data warehouse, uh, being able to... Um, uh, look at data. One of the big things, it's very transparent. So when we have quality data, it doesn't exist just on a corporate level. It exists down on a, on a hospital level. Uh, and it actually goes down, there are unit level reports so that nurses can see on the floor how many cordies they had this month, how many they've had all year, where they were last year, 
uh, and th this, you know, and so can the doctors on the floor and the residents on the floor. So we've really invested in, in getting dashboards out to everybody and uh, making sure they're aware of where we are and what we have to do. Uh, that's been one of the technological things that we've done. Uh, obviously, we're working now with machine learning, uh, and we're, we're investing in, in that in order to both uh, look at predictors of patients coming in, of who are going to be the people that need the extra help in terms of population health management uh, versus the patients who don't. Uh, you know, some patients are obvious, but some patients are less obvious. The other area we're doing that in now is with social determinants. We've not been happy uh, with the way we've always uh, cataloged people in terms of catalog them in terms of social determinants, and it's not just. And we've also learned it's not just a matter matter of uh, race, ethnicity, religion, anything like that. It really gets back to the other social determinants. So we have a whole group in, uh, that works on this. Uh, you saw Dr. Raju in the uh, in the video uh, who work on this area, and we're really now exploring uh, how technologically we can use social determinants to help predict where we need help, especially in the transitions of care as people leave the hospital and go into the outpatient area. The other area we've used technology to improve quality uh, is telehealth. Uh, so, for example, about Five years ago, we developed telepsychiatry. It's almost impossible uh, to have full-time psychiatrists available 24-7 in, in every hospital. I mean, there's just not enough psychiatrists around to be able to do it. So what we've done is we used our psychiatric hospital, one of our two psychiatric hospitals, used their emergency room as the hub, and we provide telehealth psychiatry consults to patients in other emergency rooms in smaller hospitals, especially at night. Uh, what this has done is two things. Uh, one is it has delivered the right care at the right time, and number two is it, it, it has been great for patients. Very often a patient came in at 10 o'clock at night, they might have to sit in the emergency room at 8 o'clock in the morning to be evaluated by a psychiatrist. That is not fair or appropriate for a patient, especially for a patient who's having a, 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 a behavioral health issue. Uh, so we've, been, we've harnessed telehealth for that. Uh, and the other thing we've recognized with that is, you know, psychiatrists were spending 40, 45 minutes with every average patient. And then it became clear that about half of that time was spent on non-physician necessary type uh, work. Some of it was social work, et cetera. So we've kind of changed changed it now, so it's not just the psychiatrist who gets on the telehealth call uh, video, but it's also we use the social workers and other ancillary people so that we can uh, maximize the ability of using our psychiatrists, yet at the same time accomplish what we need to do. Similarly, we've used technology with the, electron, the EICU, not to replace intensivists, but to provide an extra level of support and it's not only just another set of eyes, but by using EICU technology, uh, there are algorithms that will tell us when a patient is starting to get into trouble before they actually get into real trouble, and therefore the staff can be alerted to this. And it's very hard when if you have two, three sick patients in a 20-bedded unit who are you know, having major problems to keep your eyes on the other 17 and keep evaluating them properly. And this, is provide, this technology has provided another layer that has helped us deliver, uh, you know, what we think is better quality. Mark, could you talk just for a minute and along this line about anything that you found uh, specifically helpful with regard to the emergency department? I know you have some unique uh, patient transport relationships, but uh, can you talk a little bit specifically about ED? Yeah, sure. Well, our emergency rooms, especially at some of our hospitals, I'm sure are like most of you on the phone are overcrowded, huge number of patients. So we've taken a, we've ta we tried a few different things. We actually, as a joint venture now, have 50 urgent care centers. Interestingly, they've really not they they've not really reduced the number of people in most of the hospitals, uh, most of the people accessing emergency rooms uh, for non life threatening issues. Uh, but it does provide another access point, which we use for other things. Uh, in terms of the emergency rooms, in terms of transport, uh, what we try to do is 
uh, regionalize certain things. So one hospital in an area will be the heart hospital. One hospital in the area will be uh, a stroke, you know, a comprehensive stroke center. So, you know, a patient may get the initial treatment for stroke at the uh, smaller community hospital, and we also have telestroke as well, so they get it in a very timely fashion. But we have a we have 150 now it's 160 ambulances of our own that allow us to transport patients back and forth so that we can get people to the right place for the right care. In addition, uh, we have a helicopter because we're over a wide space so that we can transport very ill patients very quickly uh, and not be worried about the typical Long Island or New York City traffic, uh, which uh, you can only imagine what it's like. Uh, so we've done those modalities to help move patients to the right care because it's easier, you know, sometimes it's hard to get, you know, that level, that tertiary level care at a smaller community hospital. Now, most patients obviously don't need transfer, but when it is necessary, we have, a, you know, a, a good mechanism for it. And the motto for the transfer center, because we have a single number they can call, is always say yes. <laughs> we don't want people arguing, well, they really don't need to come. We can always do an analysis afterwards and say, you know what, maybe this one did need to come. Here's what you got to think about for the next time. But we never want the patient caught in the middle. Excellent. I, I want to step back a bit and ask you, can you lay out for us the sort of organizational structure of the quality program, sort of cascade us down from the system to individual sites? Sure. Um, you know, it gets back to the issue that we kind of talked before uh, about hospitals and their own culture and what they do. So, you know, do you have a, a, a federalist system or a public system? You know, is it states' rights or federal rights? We have a corporate infrastructure for quality, which helps, you know, guide the system strategy, um, is available for help whenever a local hospital is having problems with a tough root cause analysis or a tough problem clearly swoops in and helps whenever regulatory agencies are involved or in, uh, which in our health system, because of its size and because of New York, 85% uh, of, uh, of business days, we have at least one regulatory agency in one of our sites. Um, you know, and that's not because necessarily bad happened, that's just because of the number of visits we get uh, by all the different agencies. Uh, so they help with that. However, the, the, the majority of the quality work in terms of root cause analysis, et cetera, is all done at the local level. There is a quality infrastructure at the local level. If it's a smaller hospital, it might be a site director for quality. Uh, if it's a larger tertiary hospital, it could be an associate executive director for uh, quality who's on par with also the chief nurse for that hospital and the medical director for that hospital. They all work together as a team. Uh, corporate is there to help set the strategy, uh, we follow metrics with them. So if we start to see one hospital starting, the metrics are starting to drop and they really haven't, they haven't heard that they're addressing it, uh, we will then you know, just ask them what's going on and help them with anything. And most importantly, we share on the corporate level lessons learned between all of our hospitals. So if we have an event that happens in one hospital, what our board committee on quality always says is they never want to hear that after we fixed it at one hospital, it happens someplace else. Uh, so we work very hard on making sure that major, you know, major corrections occur at every single site in our health system. And we have meetings. In fact, my meeting this afternoon is uh, with the quality leads uh, from all the hospitals, and we discuss the two or three main cases that we had that we felt had major system uh, effects, you know, system errors and system effects that we discuss them uh, together to make sure that they're monitoring for it, assessing for it, and that they have a corrective action for their local hospital. Thanks. Uh, another question I want to have around uh, data transparency, you talked a little bit about this in your presentation, but could you kind of walk us through how you specifically share data both with health plan to our payers for your patients and also with the community at large. You talked about some programs about sharing information in the community. Can you speak to both of those? Sure. Uh, so actually, before New York State came out and said, and then, you know, CMS, you know, publishing uh, hospital infections, our CEO said, 
let's do it, patients should know about it. Uh, we try to put out uh, as much as we can uh, within the limits that, you know, we all have of the quality, you know, of, of protective stuff for quality in terms of RCAs and peer reviews. Uh, but we try to put out our numbers for everybody because, quite frankly, it's the patient's rights to know, you know, what your infection rate is for joint replacements if you're going to one of our hospitals for a joint replacement. Uh, so we feel that's an important principle. Uh, we also make sure that our staff has access through our intranet to any of our data so that they, can, they themselves are familiar with it. As I said, there are the uh, nursing unit level uh, reports um, as well. In terms of the payers, um, it's, it's interesting because very often they will come back uh, with data based on their patients, which, you know, if it's a commercial payer, maybe a young population, it may not be reflective of what we see in the general population. So we try to share what we see with the payers uh, in our general population, which will include, obviously, the CMS measures and, and Medicare. Uh, but we will often, uh, you know, share other data that we have uh, that demonstrate, you know, that that goes along with uh, whole populations rather than just their specific managed care plan or their specific uh, com a commercial payer. In effect, we make um, we often when we when we look at quality gates and quality metrics with them, uh, we try to do it on a general population basis rather than just their specific population, which may not be that large. Uh, just another point I'd like to make uh, in terms of data. Um, incentives that occur for both for leadership both at the hospital level as well as at the corporate level uh, are tied. One of the five pillars of that is a quality measure. And what we've done at the hospital level, as well as obviously at the corporate level, but at the hospital level, 80% of your measure is based on how you're doing at the hospital. But 20% of it is based how we do as a system. And the rationale for that is we're all in it together, and we want the sharing of data throughout. In addition, all of our meetings, we present data. So today, for example, I, we had the medical director's meeting with all the medical directors around the, the health system. So I spent 20 minutes going over all our hospital-acquired condition data, all the numerators, as well as the standard infection ratios, our mortality data, um, a, you know, um, somebody else also talked about our readmission data. We go over the data every place we can, and when we see somebody is not doing as well, we go to the people who are doing well and said, you know what, can you give them a call or go over there and see what you're doing may be applicable over there to help. Uh, and that sharing of best practices by, uh, based on data mat metrics, I think it's helped drive improvement uh, tremendously. Mark, thank you so much. There's one last question that's probably most appropriate for, for me to field, but before I take that on, I'd like to uh, really congratulate you and the team at Northwell for all that you've accomplished in your community, and, and thank you for sharing your time and experiences with all of us today. The last question is, what advice would you share for a standalone hospital that doesn't have the breadth of resources as a system as large as Northwell, and how could we excel in areas addressed in the application and be a real contender to win the prize? The committee has separate applications for systems and for standalone hospitals, and our survey teams are really geared to look at the same issues across both, just it's a difference of scale. So on the system side, we're looking at, you know, how does the system manage a population across usually a much broader geography and from more diffuse sites. But for the standalone hospital, it's how do you engage the community, your workforce, what's your quality program, how does that impact, how do you measure it? So the actual discussion and measurement and description of programs is, is similar whether it's a standalone facility or whether it's a system. And I'd point out that in the past, uh, five years of the award, we've had standalone hospital systems uh, represented at all levels from top prize down to uh, honorable mention and citation of merit uh, category. So uh, the last pitch on the slide in front of you is that we would like to encourage you to share your, your journey with us. Uh, 
The Quest for Quality Prize application will be available at the website. Uh, you see the, the link here on the screen beginning on April 15th. Uh, Dave Carlin at AHA is our coordinator. His contact information is there, both email and telephone. If you have any inkling of wanting to apply, Dave can guide you through the process, help you with an application, and uh, walk you through things from that point. So we certainly would encourage you to do it. We had some wonderful, wonderful uh, applicates, applications during the, uh, the 2018 cycle. We're getting ready to survey the 2019 contenders and encourage all of you to participate in the upcoming year. Thanks for joining us today and uh, with that I'm going to sign off. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's presentation. You may disconnect your phone lines, log off your webinars, and thank you for joining us this afternoon.